So you've got you've got a pretty good or interesting relationship with someone that is involved in a high level um, event in the Super Bowl, and um, mm -hmm. you know a lot of people that have followed you or are you know kind of interested in your uh, experiences and your journeys uh, have heard you talk about Joe Cullen. Does it surprise you at all that um, that Kansas City, uh, their defense has had success, or more specifically, their defensive line has just not even had success, but improved more and more since Joe Cullen got there? So, I guess for the, for the listeners, when I was, um, <clears throat> I got to give you a little bit of the background, so I guess they know. Yeah, but please. Joe do. Cullen. When I was recruited in high school to play sports in college, one of the, the women who recruited me was Jim Reed and uh, the defensive line coach, Joe Cullen. And Joe Cullen, at the time, was the defensive line coach at the University of Richmond, but previously he played nose guard at the University of Massachusetts, and he was an undersized nose guard at that. So he was probably 5'10", 5 5'11", 5 240 pounds, 250 pounds. And he played very well, and very intense, uh, overachiever, very smart academically. And he became a great, great coach. And um, worked his way through the ranks, coached at some really great schools, LSU. Um, you, you know, uh, where else, uh, Randy? Was it Ole Miss? Yeah, or, yeah, Indiana. Um, Indiana. He kind of worked his way through the ranks. Several NFL teams as a defensive line coach. And he's currently the defensive line coach for the Kansas City Chiefs. Ironically, I did some work with Chris Jones, who's a defensive tackle for the Kansas City Chiefs. And, you know, arguably, we all know Aaron Donald. And Aaron Donald is a fantastic defensive tackle. But Chris Jones is, in my opinion, is right there with him. Very dominant. And when Coach Cullen was hired to be the defensive line coach, I immediately messaged Chris and said, are you aware of who your defensive line coach is? And he said, some guy by the name of Cullen, Joe Cullen. I said, there's a lot to that, my friend. I said, you better get ready. He goes, I'm sure he knows how to like coach pros and all, but I mean... The thing about Joe Cullen, he's a very unique person. He's very intense, very fiery, uh, very passionate, but he takes it very seriously. Uh, I mean, who doesn't at the NFL level? But he, he, he's very, very tough on players. Very tough on players. He's so tough on players that when he first got to the NFL, I said, you probably can't coach the same way. And his immediate reaction was, why not? And I said, well, because they're pros, you know, they're not kids who you have to discipline and be extra hard on. And he said, nothing changes. And I was actually very surprised to hear that. But you've talked to players that played for him in the professional league. What, what have they said about it? Has it changed? Yeah. So I used to work at a place called Bomberito Performance uh, for P. Bomberito. And P. Bomberito is an awesome, awesome coach. And uh, at the time, one of the defensive tackles who was um, going through Pete's program had, was, had Coach Cullen for a coach in the NFL. And I said, hey, uh, what has your experience been like with Coach Cullen? And I said that like during a training session or, and the guy looked at me and said, how do you know Coach Cullen? I said, I played for him at the University of Richmond. I had him as a defensive line coach for four years. And when I said that, the look that he gave me was like, you had Coach Cullen for four years? I said, yeah. He kind of put his head down and went, Phew. He was like, that's some real shit. <laughs> because as you know, it's a very, very uh, lively meeting room in practice. And it's very intense. And and as you know, Randy, it's not for everyone. Yeah, it, like explain a little bit, like 
you know, because we can, we can, we laugh about it now, but explain his leadership style and his approach as best as you can for somebody who may not understand truly what it means, you know, to be a part of an organization with a leader like that. Yeah, I think it's hard to explain. Like, it, it, I'm going to say a few words here and people are going to say, oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I had a coach like that, too. And but, I mean, it's not going to do it justice, but since the purposes of our our chat. You know, I can think of two instances that we talk about it all the time, you and I, but the movie Whiplash, how the teacher's really, 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 really hard on people. And you never know if you're going to make it through practice, not because of like physical abuse, just because the goal is to practice. I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but in practice, practice is designed to make you fail. And you fail so you can see things coming and have better awareness on the field. Okay, so, but we practice so hard to get it right. And the saying now is you practice, if you practice long enough, you have to practice in a manner as which you can never do it wrong. Okay, so with Coach Cullen, there was no right. But that that was the point. I can think of... Uh, Admiral McRaven's speech, the make your bed speech, when he says, when the SEALs go through training, they have to make their bed every day. Or, or uniform inspection, uniform inspection. There's never a uniform that's perfect. But that's the purposes of the drill. There is no perfect. It's how you respond to constantly failing is what matters most. And I think there's a lot of people who don't understand the lesson in that. People say, well, why would I do that if I know I'm going to fail all the time? Well, what is your attitude going to be like when you fail over and over and over and over again? And if you're just doing it for, hey, I'm doing this because I know I'm going to get this. I'm just doing this and I know I'm this. I understand that. I, I have a, situations in my life like that. But if you're, you have a defeatist attitude all the time, because you're not getting what you want, then it's going to be very, very hard to rise up and do well. If you only are happy or feel great when things are going well, you're going to be very unhappy most of the time, right? And I think that was the, the key to that. When we would do drills with Coach Cullen, he would say, do it again. And then he'd say, do it again. he say, oh, I had a coach like that, but when you have to do it again 15, 20 times in a row, all practice, and you're exhausted, and you, there's no pleasing that coach. And that's very hard to deal with. I mean, there were guys who just packed up and left. And that puts it in, pers in perspective. If you have a kid who's getting a full scholarship to a school that's you know $50,000 a year, for four or five years and he's giving it up because he cannot take the pressure or the workload and the 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 psychology of things well then that gives you a great understanding of to how challenging it can be yeah and it's not just um the repetitions either like you were saying and it, it's not necessarily um there is some, there's a physical hardship to it, but the, the mental side of that and the emotional side, like he's not just saying, do it again, do it again, do it again. It's not, it's not very cordial like that. I mean, there, um, there is a, there, there's a mental attack side to it as well. Explain that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, in today's world, um, yeah. I mean, you know, we joke about it, but you know, if you have the, the, that, you know, no one can talk to me like that. Or the coaches, you know, at this point, anything can be viewed as abusive, right? So that's just there. There. Remember what I said with with practice. Practice is designed to put you in situations so you fail, and you keep failing so you can react faster, faster, have better awareness, 
and, and respond quickly, athletically, and intelligently as it pertains to the sport. But they, they're they putting you in a very high-stress environment and throwing a lot of things at you. So it's probable that you're going to make a mistake. So the language, the volume, the sense of urgency, the repetition, um, the proximity of where the words are coming from, like they're very close to you, the coach could be right here, and you you have to work through that and break through those mental barriers. And there's a lot there. There's a lot, I mean, there's a lot there. And if it's, you know, coach is picking on me, coach doesn't like me, coach is giving me a hard time, coach hates me, uh, he's playing favorites. You know, it's uh, it's very easy to fall into that to create excuses so you don't have to deal with that. And I think that that happens a lot of the time. Let me create a, a bunch of excuses so I don't have to deal with any of this. So how did you, I mean, you said earlier, like this, this, this type of leadership style is not for everybody. <clears throat> Probably, you know, for much less than it, it would be for, for much more. Um, but what did you, like, how, do you feel like his coaching method and his leadership style uh, maximized your ability or your potential? Did it benefit you? Mm -hmm. And if so, did it also hinder you in some way? Like, what was the balance and how did you, you know, how did you receive that and how did you work with it? You know, there's a scene, there's a, there's a scene in that movie Whiplash where they sit down in the, uh, the diner and he says, you know, the greatest uh, uh, drum drum what would you call him drummer. a drummer drummer yeah or live like he just wouldn't give up but that's what made him the greatest like he was on the edge but he wouldn't give up and you know that the 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 mental side of it the the physical side of it the physical challenges of it like football is football like, there's thousands of people who play football every year but we're really let's be honest we're really not talking about football we're talking about a lot of other things in the way the coaching and the leadership is delivered. And as you said before, Randy, it's really not for everyone. But the people who stayed and the people who pushed, there were a lot of kids there who ended up being all conference players, all Americans, NFL players. And this it's not exactly Alabama, right? So it that part is uncommon and you, you have to make a decision, you know, in your head every day. I know the only way I will fail is if I give up. And, and you know, you hear people say, you know, I never thought about giving up and that you know, doesn't cross my mind and I'm a warrior. And I, I laugh and I say, well, if you're not contemplating giving up, it's really not that hard. Right. Let's be honest. If the thought goes through your head and you're like a well, super focused, mindful, well conditioned, strong athlete and you're thinking about giving up, that should tell you something. You know, it's not because you're weak. It's not because you're, you know, you're not strong. It's not because you don't care. It's because you in your head, you're weighing, is it worth it to go through this torment? Like, why, why is this important? And I remember him saying, you know, it's very likely that you will not like a lot of this experience, but you will be a fantastic football player. You will win and you will excel if you give me everything you have. And they delivered on all of that stuff and you know it. You know, so, I mean, I heard a few years ago, I heard a offensive lineman from an NFL team 
who was talking about the Patriots, and he said, and this is when the Patriots, you know, not this year, but previous years when they were doing very well for many, many years. And the offensive lineman from another team said, I would never want to play for that organization. It's like a miserable life. Everyone's under pressure, and who who would want to do that? He's like, I don't know, says the guy with like, uh, what's it, five, six Super Bowls? I mean, that's that's why he does it. Everyone knows that. If it's uncomfortable and it's challenging, I mean, there's a reason for that. You don't look at it as like what you put yourself through in the meetings and in the, you know, the difficult times and the mental warfare and the psychology you go through. Like you could be playing, you could be like a star. The next week you might not even play. Like there's, that's, there's an intention behind that. You didn't, in one week you didn't become a bad player. But they're, they're doing psychological things for a reason. You have to know that, right? And you've made a decision in your head that I'm going to stay the course and I'm going to do everything I can. So you, you have to make a, a conscious decision every day. Find a way to win, to persevere, to push yourself. Whatever that means to you, by the way, because it's different for everyone. Would you would you say that like everybody maybe not at the level of intensity that coach, you know that Joe Cullen brings, mm-hmm. but but would you say that like or recommend that, you know, hey everybody needs to experience a Joe Cullen in their life at least once. You know you say that, but, and I know what you mean by that, and I don't yeah. necessarily disagree with you, but you have to be. Really, really, you know, everyone should, but Randy, let me ask you, why would they? I mean, there's a lot of people that they look at it as like, when I'm going to, you're not sacrificing something, right? Mm -hmm. If you lift weights, if you run, if you put up with that crap, you put up with the mental torture, the physical abuse, all that stuff, you're doing that as an investment, because an investment, you get a return and you're expecting something in return. Some people think they're sacrificing and the people who think they're sacrificing don't understand that it's actually an investment. And that investment doesn't have to be wins and losses. That investment could be, it's making me a better human. Why? Because I need to be challenged and pushed. Yeah, but you, so you said, um, what you said was towards the end there, before you started talking about the book Driven, was that, you know, you need to be challenged, um, you know, and I, I think, you know, I, I think I know what you were saying. You wanted, you need to be challenged in order to not just improve, but to, um, you know, to, to in, 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 in the terms that you were using to increase your investment or your return on the investment, yeah. right? And and I was going to, I was going to like, you know, kind of carry on with that. Like, you know, most people there, you know, it's very seldom to find somebody who has the internal capacity to like push themselves beyond, you know, what somebody else would push them or where somebody else would push them. Right. Like it, it's very rare to find somebody like you yourself and most people who follow you and, and know who you are would, would agree that you're one of those people, right? You, you don't need somebody from the outside to be that external motivation or that that driving factor for you to push yourself beyond the limit. You have that internally. So yeah, I guess that's why I was asking, like, why you you know do you think or do you recommend that everybody should experience a Joe Cullen at least once in their life, and not 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 necessarily at the at the intensity yeah. at the same level of intensity of Joe Cullen, but somebody that is willing to challenge you. Um, beyond where you'll push yourself in order for you to like break a plateau or break some sort of barrier to to get you to another level of who you want to be or who you you know who you need to be, um, and they don't care like you know they right. don't they don't care if they hurt your feelings they don't care if it's you know whatever but but they're willing to push you beyond that limit it is if that makes sense yeah I mean I believe there's there's a few. 
there's a few things that I could think of, but I mean, I believe yes. I, I obviously, I certainly believe yes. But I mean, you have to. I have to be so careful. You know, anyone in like uh, a business or a team organization, you got to be careful when you talk to people because you want to be respectful, you want to be understanding, you want to be kind, and I think all those things are really important. This is a very um, that was a very unique. I was younger, but it's not just that. It's you have to be open to that. And you have to want that. And it's yeah. like one of those things like be careful what you want, what you ask for. Because I, I, be I believe that unless you experience that, you'll never get the best out of yourself. Like you, you think you will. And, and I'm not saying that makes you good or bad, but the only way, if you've ever been truly angry, okay, frustrated, upset, uh, you know, emotionally tormented, you be, you, you realize how much strength and power you have, right? And they're trying to bring that out of you because that's another level. It's another, it's the third door. And that doesn't, by the way, that doesn't mean it's healthy. That doesn't mean it's good. It just means that if we can get access to that, you're going to perform, you know, extremely well under pressure uh, in challenging situations. And that's why I was referencing the book Driven. There are certain people that they need to be in these harsh, horrible, challenging, uh, adversity-filled environments to feel extremely comfortable. You know? I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but they that's, that's when they feel like they're being their true self. And for years and years, I thought it was like something disturbing or a disorder or something bad because growing up, they say, this is a uh, learning disability. This is a disorder. And because they label it that, so you're like, okay, I have a disorder. I have a, a disability. When in fact, this book is saying that those really aren't disorders. Those are terms that people have put on these behaviors, but to the contrary, those things are actually gifts that can help you excel. And I've never heard that in my life until I read that book. And I don't know, maybe there, maybe the guy who wrote the book has those things and he's trying to justify it, but he has, you know, studies, scientific proof, blogs, journals, and all these things that show these people are incredibly productive and they have ADHD, they're dyslexic, they have behavioral disorders, and they were told that they would never excel at anything in their prospering. Mm -hmm. So, you know, choose what you value, you know? Yeah. yeah you, you, I mean, there were, there was, there were quite a few, um, like interesting points you brought up in that one of them was, you know, it just came to my head when you were saying that you'll never truly push yourself unless you've experienced something like where somebody kind of like makes you realize you haven't pushed yourself yet. Like you think you've pushed yourself, but you, you have it. And when somebody well, makes you realize it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Randy, but they, you, well, of course we tell ourselves that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Tell ourselves, oh, no, no, no. You don't understand. I really kill myself. And by the way, the reason we even say those things is because saying those things gives us gratification and there's a dopamine hit associated with telling other people how awesome I am. Mm. I'm going to tell you, oh, I did this, I did this, I did this, and I do this, and put my hands on my hips and I have the Superman pose and it's awesome. But at the end of the day, you should get more gratification out of doing it and experiencing it as opposed to telling other people and likely strangers because they don't care. You're just trying to make yourself feel better. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that, um, you know, but I was thinking, um, what came to my head when you were talking about, um, you know, just experiencing that ability to push yourself. I was thinking of the movie Full Metal Jacket and, you know, it, you know, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of lessons to be taken away from that. But what I was thinking was, you, you know, everybody obviously looks at the gunnery sergeant um, and, and is like, man, that guy is just like he is the he is the epitome of a jerk. 
Like that right. is what a a just a you know prototype jerk looks like and acts like and talks like, and the way he treated Powell was like unimaginable, right? And we all like and as a natural human being, you kind of feel sorry for him. But before, like you know, when he he hit a point, when Powell hit a point, and he obviously went, you know, he went into an unhealthy zone. But he actually started to improve, like he it was, was making the yeah. And it was, it was amazing. like he, he, but he, you know, he was in an unhealthy state. But what the what the gunnery sergeant was doing was actually working, you know, in order to make him a soldier, right. you know. Right. But um, and, and there's you know, so I guess you know there there's a, a there's a conversation to be had there, where that that actually served its purpose his style served its purpose but the person receiving the recipient on that end um i guess didn't receive it um with the intent with the with the with what the intention was i mean he obviously was getting better but mentally he lost it right so i, I guess i don't know talk a little bit about just that healthy balance i mean i yeah. guess we discussed that already it was yeah but but you know it's like First of all, one of my favorite movies for several reasons, but, you know, that drill instructor, one of the most amazing, and I know it, it's it's protocol for like the Marine Corps, from what I hear, but, you know, at the beginning he says, I am hard, but I am fair, and I am hard, you will not like me, but the more that you hate me, the more you will learn. And it sounds horrible and it sounds that's not right. And you can be a great teacher without that. And I don't deny any of those things. Uh, you can be a great teacher without any of those things. But this is a different type of thing. We, in a very short amount of time, I have to get this person from point A to point B. And I need them to do this. And the reason they need to do this is because if they can't do this and we send them there, they will die. That's it. So I have a lot of responsibility, like, you know, a lot of the times, like with, with teams and I, I talk about like, you know, work, but the, this is the result we need. How you get there, I'm going to tell you what has worked for me in the past, but how you get there, that's up to you as long as you get there. Now we're not, we have core values and we have you know, things we follow, we have conduct and we have policies, but at the end of the day, if you, if you don't violate any of those things and you get there, that could be best. You know, um, I think that in that movie, Pyle was pushed to a place that wasn't healthy, but as you said, it got him to where he needed to be and it worked. The, the one X factor is you have no idea what a person can handle. So a person like Coach Cullen, he's pounding people to get a response. And if you can handle it, great. If you can't, great. But you can't be here if you can't handle it. And that is what it is. So, you know, like, you know, Pyle had a mental breakdown. But... There's very few people that can handle, you know, verbal abuse in in physical torment for, you know, a day, weeks, years. As you know, and it, it wasn't that it was mean. It was just it's a lot. It's a lot on your mind. It's a lot in your psyche. It's a lot in your central nervous system. And and like I said before, guys, this isn't preaching pounding chest. I'm not saying it's good. For me, it was good for that. That's it. And I, you know, there's a lot of factors that we haven't talked about. This is a coach. He pushes you. He's hard on you. He holds you accountable. He's an adult man. I didn't have a father. I would talk every day about, it would be great to have someone really hard on me. It would be great... I would say every day I would tell people if someone was there to hold me accountable, that would be great. It would be great if there was a male figure in my life who wanted to push me so I could do well. Well, uh, right. <laughs> but if you, if you have a father, 
and you think that your father's the best and he's the best teacher and may it might not it may not have worked out right and a lot of those kids that they recruited didn't have fathers so not necessarily a coincidence no not at all that's yeah. another good point that you bring up um something that i kind of have a problem with today um, I agree with you on that. Like that, that leadership style is not for everybody, um, obviously. And, and more so, I think that's more relevant today, right? I think there were more Joe Cullens 40, 50 years ago, oh, yeah, yeah, even course. 30 or 20 years ago, right? There was a lot, it was more common to find a Joe Cullen than it is today. Oh, Randy, um, now you have no yelling policies on coaching staffs. Right, right. You can't, I mean, and, and so here's the thing I, I have a problem with is that if you do come up today, if you do come across a Joe Cullen or someone whose leadership style just doesn't match you. Now, I'm talking about in situations where you kind of have a choice, right? Like right. you have a choice of what professor or what school you go to to play a sport, right? You know, you know that coach, right? And you have a choice. Yeah. I, today, I, there's been put, you know, too much um, weight given to the the recipient versus the leader, right? You know, the, 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 the follower, the, you know, the athlete, the student, whoever the recipient is of that leadership style, too much weight has been given to them. If you choose to go there and you don't fit with that leadership style, it should be up to you to get out of there. Like your, 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 you know, inability to, to mesh with that leadership style is not the leader's fault. If the leader is there, they're there for a reason. Right. I, I believe now, listen, there's certain there's certain situations where there are leaders in charge that shouldn't be in that place. Right. But for the most part, like when you have a choice to 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 go to that environment and that leader's there and they're established and you don't mesh with that. Like today, we're so quick to get rid of the leader, like, yeah. you know, one athlete, one student, one person complains and says, like, oh, this is terrible. Like I'm having the worst experience of my life. They fire the leader. Well, yeah. no, you chose to go there. Like yeah. you go somewhere else. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, that's very interesting. Like you have an athlete, let's say, let's just say athlete. Athlete goes to a school and, you know, starts off great. Then all of a sudden there's a point in the road where it gets hard and it gets hard and the athlete says, you know, the leader's not doing a great job, but what the the athlete is really saying is that I'm not happy. He's not doing a great job with me. And maybe he's prompting some sort of response that you get rid of the leader. Now, because he's a leader, we assume that he can uh, um create or modify his leadership style, modify his leadership style for each athlete where he was hired because his leadership style is something that would probably mesh well with most athletes. We didn't say all, most. And the ones that don't feel it, they're saying that, you know, this guy's not doing a good job. Now he's not doing a good job because they are coming there. We're hearing getting variables and data from their experience. Now, if the person, the athlete is an incredible game player, but he's not a great practice player and the coach only values practice players who do well in practice, that's how they get in the game. That kid's going to hate his experience. Right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's knowing what those coaches value. So you can say, if you don't value that, you can't say, this is a bad coach. You can say, it's not the place for you. And if it's not the place for you, there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the thing. I'm tough. This is, this is the hypothetical said athlete. I'm tough. I'm a warrior. I'm going to go beast mode. I'm about the culture. I'm going to kick ass. I'm going to do everything possible. I don't think I want to be there because you have a little adversity. I mean, that's the whole point, right? Yeah. Like you, you, 
the games haven't even started until, when I say games, the true challenges, the true obstacles, they don't even start until you get to that place. When you get to that place, now we know who you said you were. We're going to find out who you really are because that's what you said. But I mean, there's things I go through every day that I'm, you know, I, I, I believe certain things about myself and then I get in these situations and I go, man, I hate that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think with me, I'm, I'm a character guy. I'm big on character. So if something, you know, if, if, if you know, you say you're going to do something, but you don't do it, that's a, that's a little bit different. But if someone's pushing me, I don't, I don't view them as like they're bad. It, there's a lot there, you know, there's a lot there. Like you, I, I'm, I think you have to be really mindful of when things aren't going well for you, I'm going to say you're bad. I'm going to say the coaching's bad. I'm going to say the culture's bad. I'm going to say that they don't know what they're doing. I probably know better. Um, and you have no data points to say that you could do it better. Right? Like they say, like the head coach would always say, of the two of us, there's only one of us who's been a head coach for 30 years. But you think you could do better. Like, it, it's a nice argument. It sounds nice, but you don't have a compelling argument. Mm -hmm. Right? You're a first or second year player. You have very little experience. It's done, but, and, and we can fall into the conversation of, we're not telling you your opinion doesn't matter. We're just telling you, up until you arrive... This person has done this, 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 and this. Now you showed up and said, not a good coach. Right. What you're really saying is not a good coach for you, which is, you know, that's fair. It's possible. You know, that's possible. I remember uh, I heard a story. Someone was telling me a story. You know, I was a great player and I was a great football player and I didn't get to play. And this college, this coach just had it out for me and I was pissed and it really bothered me and kind of ruined my opportunities. And I'm thinking, you probably weren't very good because if you were really good, the coach, you know, coaches really love to win. And if you were really good, you would have played. So it's not a conspiracy, but we tell ourselves those things because it makes us feel better. Mm -hmm. Because the it's last thing we're going to, yeah, we, the last thing we're going to say is, wait a minute, maybe I really wasn't that good. Maybe I had a lot of floors. Maybe my attitude sucked. Maybe I could have done a lot better. Maybe I'm really protecting my ego. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, but that's... How many people do we know who uh, swallow that pill? You know? That's... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I mean, that... That was... Um, you know, j just to you know finish off that was... Um, you know, I didn't, I, when, when I when I ask you that question, I, I don't want people to think that I, I think it's okay for you to run away if you come across some adversity, like a coach or a leader whose style doesn't mesh with your, you know, your character. But um, because I, I think that's a that's a that's a whole another issue in society today is that, you know, we we just uh, we come across some adversity and it's like you know, the easiest and the most cordial thing to do is just, oh, well, you know, just quit that and go somewhere, you know, like even in the church, right? So like somebody goes to church and there's some people in the church they don't get along with. They say, oh man, this church is imperfect. Like, you know, whatever, I'm gonna go find another church. And it's like, there is no perfect church. Like you're never gonna find a church where everybody's perfect and you're all on the same page. In yeah. marriage, right? Yeah. Look at the divorce rate. People get into a marriage and they hit some adversity and it's like, Ah, you know what? I'm just gonna let's just get a divorce. I'm gonna go find somebody else, and like, and I mean, everything we do in society has been, you know, like it's okay for you to give up. It's okay for you to quit. It's okay for you to just, you know, find something that, you know, meshes with you that makes you happy. You know, that fits. Yeah. And it's like, you know, so I don't want people to think that I'm I'm saying it's okay for like like this whole college portal thing with college football. Like, you know, that's a whole other conversation in itself. But, um. I'm not saying, you know, that like if you come across a coach like Joe Cullen and it doesn't mesh for you, I'm not saying like, you know, get out of there, go find somebody that that, you know, you can fit with. Um, that might be a, that's like your last resort, like your last option. But 
you know, there's something to be said about sticking it out and figuring out a way to get through that adversity. Um, well, that's that, by the way, that, that's the learning lesson. Yeah. You actually yeah. learn to yeah. figure out how, like, you know, one of the challenges in, in, in this, this discussion or, or in this scenario is I'm not happy. It doesn't make me happy. So I'm leaving. Right? Well, what makes you think that you always have to be happy? <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I want to be happy 24 seven. I, I understand that. I get that. I do. But, I, you know, <laughs> I'm not always happy. And there's a lot of things I actually don't enjoy doing. But I do know to get the things that are important to me or get to the place that is important to me, I have to do those things. So, you know, if it's like I'm unhappy and, and nothing, my mental health, I, I get it. I get it because that goes back to the pile thing, right? But, you know, we never want to go to a place where it's ruining our lives. But when you look at people who have had these super monumental uh achievements and get to a crazy place they've gone through some crazy stuff who knows maybe those people could have contemplated life maybe they could have uh gone into a psychiatric ward and come out maybe they've gone through craziness but they come out the other side and what they've done is they've figured it out and how to stay the course and work through all the things that are uncomfortable that make them unhappy that are adversity filled and, you know, saying that like, I'm unhappy, it's one thing to be unhappy. It's another thing to make a bad choice. And we all do. I made a lot of bad choices. So, you know, you, you having a great understanding and connection with what is it? What are you really saying? Like, that's hard to know. It's hard to know as a young person with limited life experience. But, you know, everyone wants to give up. I don't make enough money. Okay, you don't make enough money. But if I gave you five times the money you were making now, would you still want to do it? Hmm, I don't know. Well, it's not about money. It's about your internal drive and you taking great pride in what you do, which is what you should have with whatever you do. Regardless of what it is, I mean, it, this is such a, a deeper conversation, but if it's important to you, others will see it. And if it's not important, they'll say it's, they'll know, they'll know what your priorities are, are immediately. Yeah. What would, what would you, you know, I guess maybe to a final thing like what you know we talked about how things in society have changed quite a bit like you couldn't like you just you couldn't you couldn't say the things that you know our coaches said you know 30 years ago 20 years ago um you couldn't even like you, you probably couldn't do about 75 to 80 percent of the things that they did um so that being said, how do you, as a team leader, as a boss, uh, an employer, like how do you incorporate um, all of that knowledge into a specific leadership style that, you know, hopefully resonates with most of those under your leadership? And like you said earlier, you know, we, you know, most of those under your leadership, it's not going to be effective for hundred percent. We just know that, that that's never going to happen, but you know, how do, how do you approach your leadership style? Having experienced a Joe Cullen, um, or having experienced someone who's the total opposite of Joe Cullen, like how do you incorporate all of that into your daily business life? I put it away. I put it away. I could never use any of that, any of it. <laughs> I'm being very serious. I, I mean, those things, as I said before, were for a very specific time in my life. And they were absolutely necessary for me to get to where I wanted to be. 
And I feel like I kind of knew that. And even if that wasn't true, meaning that wasn't the case necessarily, my ego or my macho or whatever it was wouldn't let me give up. It just wouldn't. And maybe there were times that I should have given up. But I just, that that was a different part of life. Um, so you, you would say like, all right, so let's say you, you've, you've, you've pushed that aside. Like there's no way you can incorporate that type of leadership style into your leadership, you know, with, with the business you run today. So your, your approach has to be how, how, how is your approach as a leader in your organization? I mean, firstly, this, you know, the, the, we, we do this as a leadership group. There are several leaders. So I can't, you know, I can't, it's, it's certainly not me. It's certainly not all me. We share a lot of responsibilities. Each person is responsible for different things. So, but I know that the way I, I approach things, that's the only thing I can speak to. And I, I've learned a lot of lessons, I think, in the last five, six years that number one, like my way isn't the only way. I know that there's a lot, I learn a lot from uh, the people who have come in, uh, the new hires or the new team members, I learn a lot from them. I learn a lot from our, you know, uh, team leaders of either the club or the, the body architect leaders. Um, and I think it, it works both ways, right? Like, if I thought I had all the answers, that would it would it would be pushed out to them and maybe they would think that they have all the answers and then you'd be like doing this where that really gets you nowhere you, it's kind of and this is what i heard the other day rick rubin said it on on something and, and he said rick rubin you know rick rubin the uh famous music producer he said mm -hmm. you know if you think that you you have answers and you figured it out for you you know Celebrate that, but that doesn't mean that you have answers for anyone else. Meaning, I understand it's a business, leadership, you got to set rules, you got to lead the way and all those things. But just because I figure things out, I think I have for me, doesn't mean that I'm smart enough to give advice to someone else. Although I found answers for me. And I think I'm doing things in the most optimal way. I still have to be open to maybe there's a better way, right? And you have to not just say that, but actually believe that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it takes a, a group of people who can really put their egos aside and say, like, well, I'm not talking about you want to do something, Randy, so we're going to do it your way because you just want to do it that way. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about your, you suggest doing it that way because it's optimal and you create a compelling argument as to why it's more bene it's most beneficial for all of us in the entire organization that is a conversation not i don't want to do that that's not a conversation that's just emotion right and then you know what along the lines of how how i do it is i try to be as different as possible, as opposed to my former self. Meaning, my former self would say, this is the way we're doing it, and I could care less. And I don't think, I truly don't think, I mean, I think there are, there are moments that that's going to happen, but I think those are few and far between, and I think you'd be um, a suboptimal leader if you went about your business that way, or went about your team that way. Because... You have to know that anything that I do, I do it because I have a bunch of experiences from my history that lead me to believe all of these things. You know, so I might say, I think it's best because of this. And the person might say, well, why do we even have to worry about that? I say, well, maybe we could get sued for this. You have to think proactively like that, but that's why like... You know, Dabo Sweeney says, of the two of us, I'm the only one who's 45 years old. 
right? Meaning that's what he's saying to his players. He thinks that's most optimal based on all his experience, right? So we put our heads together. We talk about the pros and cons. We make a decision. But I think there are a few things. Don't think you have all the answers. Don't think that everyone's opinion is important. Everyone does need to be heard. And like how you carry yourself, conduct your business and hold conversations is extremely important. Meaning if someone has something to say, you might want to listen. It might not be important to you, but it's important to them. And it's, if it's important to them, then you need, it needs to be important to you. Or you need to value that it's important to them. Even though you might, you know, absolutely disagree, you need to value that this is important to them. I need to hear them out at the very least. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so you know, final thing, What what is your prediction for the uh, Super Bowl? What do you think is going to happen? My prediction is... Uh, Man, I would like Kansas City to win because of Coach Cullen and because of Chris Jones. Yeah. yeah I really would. That's exciting. That'd be great. But I don't know. The Eagles are very good. They have a great team. And I know the, the Philadelphia City is tough, man. Oof. So we'll see. <laughs> what do you think? I, I'm i with you. I mean, you know, I have no skin in the game other than I know Joe Cullen. So I'm rooting for him and the Kansas City yeah. Chiefs. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. That'd be great. We'll see what happens.